Hey everyone, this is Dr. Karen, and I'm so excited to have you with me today because I'm going to show you the key to building your students' academic language skills in just 30 minutes per week. So you're probably wondering why and how I'm showing you how to do this in that specific time frame. Well, it's because if you're an SLP working with the school age populations, especially if you're actually working in the schools, that's probably all the time that you have. And the reason that I was able to figure this out is, well, because quite frankly, I had to because I was working in the schools. Now, I'm guessing if you're here, you might be currently treating students with language impairments and in the past, or maybe currently, you feel like you're falling short in helping your students meet their goals on their IEPs, or you've had students that have really struggled in school even though they've been coming to see you in therapy for a really long time. Nothing is more frustrating than feeling like what you're doing isn't making any difference. I'm here to tell you that if you've experienced this, it's not your fault. Many times we feel like we're trying to teach our students so many things that we end up jumping around from skill to skill and we don't make progress on any of it. And to make matters worse, no one ever really gave us a system or protocol for treating language disorders, which means we've been left to figure it out on our own. And let's be honest, we don't have a lot of free time to do the research for something like this. Part of the problem is that no one we work with really understands what we do, which means they let our caseloads get bigger and bigger. And even when we consult with experts in our own field, we can't really get a straight answer about what we're supposed to be doing in the schools. But I'm here to tell you that there is hope because there's a pattern to these cases where students are just stuck and no one else knows what to do. And oftentimes you are the missing piece. And I want to show you exactly where you fit and why you can be the hero here. That's why in this training, I intend to show you why the only way for you to exponentially bridge the gap in your students' academic skills is to build their vocabulary. I'll also show you why the essential first step to building vocabulary is teaching the right words. And finally, you'll learn why the best qualified person to pick those high quality words is you. Now I've experienced these struggles firsthand when I started working in the schools. I actually planned to go into a medical setting but when the best option geographically for me was to work in the schools, I took the job, but planned to get out as soon as I could. And the reason I didn't want to work in the schools is because I did not want to deal with language therapy because I just flat out did not get it. So when I first started, I ended up just grabbing random things off my shelves and guessing at what I should be doing. But during my first couple years, I got asked to be part of the student problem solving team in my district that got all of the academic and behavioral referrals. And during that time, I started to notice a clear pattern with all the students who had language concerns. But before I tell you any more about that, I just have a quick couple questions for you. If someone gave you a blueprint for choosing the right skills to target in therapy, do you think you could actually be able to help some of these language cases who've been stuck in the same place forever? And what if someone actually took the time to really understand you and clarified what an SLP was supposed to be doing and what would make you different from a teaching assistant, teacher, or special ed teacher? If somebody did that, do you think that you'd actually have the skills that you need to make progress and help your students in your direct therapy time? Do you think you could be that one person that could make a difference if someone actually took the time to give you what you needed? If you answered yes to any of those questions, or if you at least wanted to believe that they're true, keep listening. So let me move on to those patterns I was seeing. 
Now, I found that as I got referrals for language, there was one thing in common that the teachers were saying. And it was that the students who were struggling didn't have the vocabulary skills needed to be able to keep up with what they were doing in the classroom. So this could mean they didn't understand the contexts of stories they were being told, or they had word retrieval difficulties, or they just plain couldn't keep up with the content area concepts covered in subjects like science or social studies, or maybe even math. And many of these students were coming out low in vocabulary when I actually went through the formal evaluations as well. So this is where I started to realize that I needed to forget about all these random little splinter skills I was trying to piece together and instead focus on the big picture so that I could actually hit the problem at the root cause. When I did some more research, I found that there's a reason that some of these kids with low vocabulary skills struggle to learn to read and spell. Let me ask you this. Have you ever found that when people are talking about something and you're not really familiar with the topic, you tend to zone out? Or if you read something that has really difficult terminology, you have to reread it a million times and then you still don't get it? That's because we need to be able to comprehend at least 90 to 95% of the words in a text in order to be able to understand it. And that's why these kids with weak vocabularies struggle so much in school. So sometimes I want to pull my hair out when people say things like, oh, Johnny's not paying attention. Maybe he just needs medicine. No, people, he's lost. Every kid who's struggling does not have ADD. We can't focus on what we can't understand. So sorry about that. I'll end my rant there. Some kids really do have ADHD or ADD, but not all of them. Some kids simply can't keep up because they're completely lost because they don't have the background knowledge to know what the heck we're talking about. I also found that vocabulary skills are kind of like a crystal ball that can predict the future. What I really mean by that is that vocabulary skills in the early grades can actually predict which students will struggle in the later grades, especially with regards to reading comprehension. I also found that because vocabulary is correlated with reading and overall academic performance, some of the research showed that if you improve those vocabulary skills, you also will see improvements in reading and spelling and overall performance in school because that word knowledge is so important to our student success. Now that we've cleared that up, let's go back to that first point that I made, which is that the only way for you to exponentially bridge the gap in your student's academic skills is to build their vocabulary. Now, of course, everybody in the school system plays an important role in building students' vocabulary. But what about those students who aren't making the cut? Those students where academic instruction in the classroom just isn't enough for them. What do we do for them? Well, to clear that up, let me ask you something. Who understands vocabulary and language acquisition better than anyone else who's working in the schools? That's right, you, the SLP. When I realized this, and I was at this point in my journey, I was like, woohoo, I'll just fix my students' vocabulary skills and we'll all do the happy dance and it'll be great. So, of course, was I right? Was building my students' word knowledge the missing element? Yes, absolutely. But if you're anything like me and you know how it is when you're working with the school age populations, you're probably feeling a little overwhelmed right now and thinking a couple of things in your head as you wonder how you can actually do this in real life. So maybe you're thinking, great, we've identified vocabulary as the culprit. Where do I even start now? Or you're wondering, okay, so I'm supposed to be building vocabulary skills that have to do with school. Does that mean I'm supposed to just review homework and worksheets and flashcards that the teachers send me? 
Because if that's the case, isn't this something that a tutor or parent volunteer could do? Isn't that all just pointless memorization? So yes, sometimes it is. Sometimes when you're using those type of materials that I mentioned, it does seem like pointless memorization. And it might be the way certain people use those tools. But the bottom line is that you, as the SLP, can add that strategic element that others can't. So you might be using some of those materials, but it's how you use them and how you pick the right concepts that really matters. So that's what you can do best. Essentially, what it comes down to is that even though you want to add that extra element of support, you can't do it all. You can't teach students everything that they need to know. So we want to be highly selective about what we're teaching our students because we want to teach them things that will help them teach themselves. So we want the concepts that we teach our students to help them learn independently when they leave our therapy room. When I first started really, really hitting vocabulary, I tried to reinforce all of the vocabulary that was coming from the classroom. So I would try to get word lists from the teachers of science and social studies vocab and reading vocab. And I found that I couldn't keep up. I couldn't even play email tag with the teachers in enough time to actually get all the words and have a session planned out because sometimes by the time the teacher and I would communicate, they'd be past the unit anyways, or past the lesson. And to make matters worse, I didn't have enough time to hit all of those words, so I ended up just rushing through them. But my epiphany came when I realized I didn't have to hit all of these concepts. My students didn't need emphasis on all of these words that the teachers were covering in class. So let me show you a couple examples to help you understand what I mean. To make my point, let me ask you a question. Do you know what a cnidarian is? What about a lithosphere? Well, my fourth and fifth graders needed to know these things for their tests. And guess what? I had to look them up because when I was put on the spot, I didn't know them either, even with a master's degree and a doctorate. And I'd be willing to guess that while these words were words that students needed to know for their tests, they probably weren't very useful to my students' lives beyond that specific content unit. Now, I'm not knocking science at all, but what I'm saying is that you don't have a lot of time. So you want to use the t little time that you have to focus on things that are going to be highly useful in your students' day-to-day -day lives. Here's another question for you. Do you know what a summary is? And do you use that word very often? And what about the word comprehend? Well, my students also needed to know what these words meant, but they needed to know these words across many contexts because they were always asked to give summaries and they always had to think about whether or not they were comprehending things. And I'd be willing to guess that you might use these words across your day-to-day -day lives as well. And the thing is that my students really didn't know what these words meant either. So these types of words were a lot more important to my students' success than those content-specific words that only happened every once in a while. When I started to realize that I needed to prioritize so that I could get the biggest bang for my buck in therapy, I started to look for research and frameworks out there or programs. And I came across the framework described by Beck, McEwen, and Kukin in their book, Bringing Words to Life. And what they did was organize vocabulary into three tiers or categories of words. My suspicions about how to prioritize words were confirmed when I read into this framework a little bit further. So Beck et al. described three different types of words, and the first one was called Tier 1, 
And these words that fit into this category are conversational words that happen often, but are easy for most kids. So this could include words like dog or pencil or any words that we use often in day-to-day -day conversational speech. The majority of kids don't need us to teach them meanings of tier one words. Tier one words are low priority simply because most kids can figure out what they mean just from the exposures they get during day-to-day -day conversation. I finally felt like I was getting part of the answer when I read further and found out that there are tier two words and these words are difficult for students and they happen often across academic settings. So this could include words like explain or persuade, which we might use sometimes in day-to-day -day conversation, but a lot of these words, because they're more complex and more formal, might be seen more often in academic specific contexts or textbooks or written language. Because these words tend to be difficult for students, many kids need us to directly explain what they mean in order for them to really understand their meanings and use them appropriately. Because they're difficult for many students and because they happen often, tier two words are a high priority for direct instruction. The third category would be tier three words. Tier three words happen in those specific content area units like science or social studies, and they're really only needed within the context of those specific units or discussions relating to those units. So this could include science words like vertebrate or social studies words like preamble. For tier three, they're technically considered low priority because they don't happen very often. So students do need some direct instruction of tier three words to understand them, but it's really only necessary to give these explanations when we're addressing specific content areas. So maybe just during those specific units in science or social studies when we need to cover those concepts, but we don't need to be addressing those words across the board. And for us as SLPs, we want to teach our students words that impact them across the board. So for us, tier three words really aren't a very high priority for our students when they come to therapy. So before I go on, I want to ask you, does learning this make you excited because it explains how you can best help your students because now we finally have some type of a framework that can help us prioritize. I know that when I learned about this, it was like, hallelujah, somebody actually took the time to explain this to us. But there's something else because as you know, we're not teachers. This framework was made for teachers. So what we can do as SLPs is actually take this framework a step further, which makes it even more powerful because it only answers part of the question. It's really good, but it gets us just part of the way there. So there's something else that we need to do. My primary thought when I first learned about this framework, and I imagine you might be thinking this too, is... I still don't think I can get to all these tier two words. So we've prioritized it, but there's still too much to cover. Because as you know, if you look at reading curriculums, a lot of them have tier two words that the teachers cover, but they have a 45 minute language arts period. We might have maybe 30, 40, if we're lucky, 60 minutes a week with our students we still can't get to all the words that teachers are covering. So we need to take this a step further when we narrow the words down. In addition to that, there's another issue that comes up too. You might be thinking, but my students don't understand the tier three words and the teachers want me to work on the tier three words and they're sending these things to speech with my students and are asking me to work on them. What do I do? 
And you also might be thinking, sure, most students understand tier one words, but my kids aren't most students. How can I work on tier two words with them when they don't even get tier one words? That's an issue too. When I actually took this framework and started using it in my therapy, I ran into these problems and questions too. The reason, obviously, that it didn't always work is because it was designed for teachers and we're not teachers, we're therapists. So what we do is a little bit different. So let me tell you a little bit about how we can take this framework and make it work for us. There's two principles that we need to understand in order to do this effectively. The first one is this, our students need more. Usually a student with a language issue isn't going to grasp onto the concepts as quickly as typically developing students. So they might need more repetition and reteaching with certain things. And they might need that special touch that we can give in our therapy time where we might be able to pick words apart and explain them in more depth than what a teacher can do in a classroom full of students. And then here's the other principle that we can understand. Our students need less. Wait, what? Didn't I just say that our students need more? Well, I did. But what I mean here is that sometimes our students will benefit more from us going more in depth on fewer things, which means we focus on teaching fewer words and really dig in and study them because what teaches our students to think about words differently is helping them pay attention to those features of words. And we can't do this if we skim right through it and try to cover too many words at once. So in order to make Beck's framework really work for us, we need to think about how they categorize the words in the first place. And we can do that by layering a framework that was defined by Longo and Curtis on top of it. So to do that, we can ask ourselves two questions when we're prioritizing words. We can ask ourselves, does the word occur often? And will learning the word increase the chances that the student will learn more difficult words? Now at first glance, it looks like these questions were what Beck used to categorize the words to begin with. But the difference is, is that we're asking ourselves these questions again after the words have already been categorized. So your first step would be to look at tier two words and see if you can narrow them down even further using these questions to a number that you could realistically target within a 30 to 40 minute time frame each week. So that clears up the issue of having too many tier two words. But one of the other questions was, what if students can't do the tier two words? Well, if that's the case, because you're the language expert, you can actually use this framework to see if your students need work in tier one. So as you're asking yourself these questions, you also want to think about whether or not those words are even appropriate for your students, because there is a chance that you might need to back up and work on tier one words. So when you're asking yourself the question of whether or not a word is occurring often, but also whether or not a word is difficult for your students, if you can say yes for tier one words, then that might be the place that you need to start for your students. So it's a little bit different than just the students in the standard population who are pretty much always going to be working on tier two. You might be spending a lot of time in tier two simply because they're highly academic, but there are certain times for your students that you might need to individualize further and go back to these easier words. And that's why this is a little bit different for therapy because it's more individualized than what the other kids are getting in the standard curriculum. And because you're the language expert, you are the one that's able to do this and figure out where your students need to be based on what words they're struggling with. So we've already talked about how vocabulary is the key to building our students' academic skills, but 
I want to go back to that second point that the essential first step to doing this is teaching the right words. In other words, we have to understand where a student is currently functioning in order to be able to take them to the next level. So that's why your expert lens is so important here. But then there's one more question. What about tier three words? Now, I'm not saying that you can't ever mention tier three words in therapy or work them in somehow, but again, they're probably not going to be as high of a priority as those tier two words, and maybe even for some students, tier one words. So all I have to say here is that sometimes it's okay to say no if a teacher asks you to work on something that's really not appropriate for your students. If you can't say yes to both of Longo and Curtis's questions, then you can't really justify spending therapy time targeting it. So I know it can be difficult to turn down the requests of your coworkers, but having a clear process for doing so can really help you to do it confidently and to have a plan for doing something else instead. So a lot of times we might just do it and do what the teachers ask us because we don't know a better alternative, but now you do. So here's where you can really advocate for your students. So whenever you start to doubt yourself, remember that third point I made at the beginning that the best qualified person to pick high quality words is you. Let me sum up those three main points one more time. So first, because we know that vocabulary is like a crystal ball that can predict which students will fail and which students will succeed, we know that the only way for us to exponentially bridge that gap in our students' academic skills is to build their vocabulary. And the essential first step to doing that is teaching the right words because we know we need to prioritize because not all words are created equally. Some of them are more useful than others. And finally, you're one of the best qualified people to pick those high quality words. And you are the best qualified person to pick high quality words for those students with language impairments. So now that we've covered this, does learning this make you feel excited about trying this with your students? And do you feel confident that you can give your students something that no one else can offer because of your unique set of skills? And do you think you could make this work for you? Do you think you could make this work for you if someone gave you lists of high priority words that are typically covered across the grade levels so you knew exactly what was happening in the curriculums and if someone told you how many words you could realistically target each week depending on how long your therapy sessions are? And could you do this if you knew how to determine if students really know a word and how to evaluate your students' vocabulary so you know exactly where to start. And do you think you could do it if someone told you exactly where classroom instruction typically falls short so you knew exactly how to fill the gaps, and if you knew how to ditch that glorified tutor feeling so your hard-earned credentials don't go to waste and you don't end up feeling confused when you're trying to reinforce the vocabulary that students need to succeed in school. Do you think you could do this if you knew these things? And if all of these things sound good to you, could I take just a couple minutes to tell you about something I've created that does all these things for you? It's called the Vocabulary Foundation. And it's an online course for SLPs that will help you to choose the right vocabulary that will help your students succeed in school. The Vocabulary Foundation has three modules with three lessons each. So that's a total of nine total video trainings. And in module one, I'll show you how we learn words and why this is different for our students with language impairments and exactly how you should approach vocabulary instruction for them differently than you would for other students in order to meet their needs. And then in module two, you'll learn how to distinguish yourself from the teacher and pick the right words for therapy, including the exact number of words per week you can aim to hit. 
And then in module three, you'll learn how to evaluate your students' vocabulary skills with both formal and informal assessments so you know exactly where your students need work, including how we know if a student really knows a word or not. I've used the framework outlined in this course for a number of different students with academic vocabulary issues. So let me tell you about a couple specific cases so you can tell if this course is right for you and your caseload. So the first student I'll tell you about, I'll call him Nick. He was one of those mild speech and language only cases where he was really struggling, but he only got special education services from me. And when he was in kindergarten, his formal language scores were falling in the mid 70s for things like vocabulary and sentence structure. And he also was scoring below average on early literacy and numeracy sk skills. So his teachers were really concerned about his progress with the academic skills as well. And I focused on vocabulary and the specific techniques that I have mentioned for you today. And what happened over the next couple years was that by the time I reevaluated him in third grade, he was doing significantly better. And I found that his vocabulary skills and his overall language skills fell within the normal range. So they were in the 90s and higher. And he also was performing average in the math and reading skills that he was doing in the classroom. So I was able to dismiss him from special education services completely, which was awesome. So this framework works really well for those mild language cases where you know that if you just gave them a boost, they could probably go through school without special education services, but you're just kind of stuck. So it works really well for that kind of case, but there are always those students who we know that they need a boost. We know it's probably not realistic to assume that we'd eventually be able to get them out of special education, but we'd at least like to help them experience some success and to be more independent and to be able to function with fewer special education supports. So let me tell you about one of those cases as well. So I'll call this student Ryan. So Ryan is on the autism spectrum. And when he started kindergarten, he was the, I would say, the speech and language as a related service student. So obviously he was getting support from other providers as well as me, but language was a huge issue for him. And his language scores across all areas were some of them falling in the upper 60s and low 70s in his vocabulary scores. And as far as his level of functioning, he needed to be in the special education class most of the day. And when he wasn't, he needed to be with the one-on-one -on -one aid. So he was significantly impacted. And over the course of the next few years, I used this framework with him when I was focusing on vocabulary. So I had to divide things up for him. He got 60 minutes a week. So for 30 minutes, I focused on social pragmatic language. And then for the other 30 minutes, I focused on vocabulary with him because he needed both. So I really had to prioritize because this student needed a lot of help and over the next few years, when I reevaluated him when he was in fourth grade, by that time, he was able to scale back to getting just resource services. So he was in a co taught setting for things like reading and math. So he was in the regular classroom. And at that point, his vocabulary was in the normal range. Now, he still needed help on social pragmatic language. But we got the vocabulary to the point where we didn't need to work on that directly in therapy anymore. So he was significantly more independent and I was able to narrow things down and, and not need to work on that vocabulary as much with him and strictly focus on the social pragmatic issues. So for him, that was a huge win because we were able to eliminate some of those things that were a huge struggle for him in his early grades. And he was doing significantly better from a functional standpoint. 
let me go over what you'll get if you sign up for the Vocabulary Foundation. First, you'll get the course modules, and that includes three hours worth of training. So again, it's three modules with three lessons apiece. So that's nine total video training. And that is valued at $297. And in those video modules, you'll learn exactly how to pick vocabulary for therapy, including how you should approach instruction for your students with speech and language impairments differently than you would for other students to meet their needs. You'll learn how to distinguish yourself from the teacher and pick the right words for therapy. You'll learn how many words to target and you'll learn the best, most efficient ways to evaluate your students' vocabulary. All so that you can help your students make real measurable progress in school. So with this package, you'll also get, in addition to the course modules that are valued at $297, and again, remember these prices are what I would charge if I was selling them a la carte, just one at a time. That's not what I'm offering you today, but this is what they would be worth if you bought them all separately on my website. So in addition to the course modules, you'll also get a booklet that's over 80 pages called 540 Tier 2 Words. And that's essentially what it is. And there's a picture of what they look like. So it's word lists and flashcards, and they're all organized by grade level. And they're all tier two words so that you know what tier two words are appropriate for what age so that you don't have to go digging through curricular materials to find tier two words that are appropriate for your students. Of course, you can always integrate some words that are related to what's going on in the classroom as well. But this way, if you don't have time to always be trying to catch up with teachers, you can have a set of words at your fingertips that you can use in therapy. And for those students who might need work with some of those basic concepts, I have also included sets of flashcards that address those tier one basic concept words. So you get a total of 168 flashcards that address temporal, spatial, and quantitative concepts for those students who need help with some of those easier words. In addition to these tools, you also get a booklet that goes along with the course modules that outlines formal assessment for vocabulary. So I go through some of the common norm reference assessments out there and tell you which ones measure what skills and how to use those effectively to help diagnose vocabulary issues in your students so that you know when you need to target this in therapy. But then I also outline how you can measure vocabulary when you are just tracking progress in therapy, when you're not necessarily trying to diagnose, but you're just trying to see if your students are making progress. So I outline how to effectively take data for those types of things as well. And so you get a booklet that goes along with that protocol. So if you were to buy all of these things separately on my website, it would cost you $465. But that's not what I'm offering you today because I know that it's really hard for you to compile all these materials and I wanna give you a better value than that so that you can get started with this right away. Now I had two choices. One was that I could offer all those things separately, but I know that that would be a big investment for you. So I wanna make this easier. So instead, I'm going to offer all of those things together at a much lower price, which I'll get to in just a minute. But here's the thing. I'm only opening up enrollment for the Vocabulary Foundation just a couple times per year to make sure I can provide the best support possible for students during those specified enrollment periods. So for this entire package I've just described, enrollment is open from now until Friday, November 3rd, at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Now, of course, this isn't for everybody, so I wanna make it really easy for you to make a decision and help you decide if this will meet your needs based on your caseload and your situation. So this course is perfect for you if you're scrambling to get your students' needs met in just 30 to 40 minutes per week, 
and you're not really sure how you can focus your therapy to address vocabulary, but you know you need to do it, then it's perfect for you. It's also perfect for you if you're struggling to keep your therapy relevant to the curriculum and your students' needs. So you know that you need to be aligned, but you know that your students aren't meeting the mark and you just want to figure out how to align things so that you can give your students what they need to succeed and catch up to their peers. This course is also perfect for you if you have students with mild to moderate language impairments who are drowning and you know they should be making progress and you're not really sure what to do next. And finally, if you're sick of second guessing yourself and you want someone to just lay it all out for you and just give you the vocabulary that your students need to become better readers and better spellers, then this course will absolutely meet your needs. Now, if you're working with students who are using AAC, who are primarily in life skills curriculums, and maybe they're minimally verbal, it might not be appropriate for that student. But if you've got those students with those academic issues and you know that they can do better if you just gave them the right boost, this course is designed exactly for those students. Now, I know that you're super busy and you might be worried about the time commitment. And that's why the course is 100% online and self-led so that you can log in and rewatch at your own pace as many times as you need to. And I've got those printable resources that help you to save time by just highlighting those key concepts so that you don't have to go digging through a lot of curricular materials. You've got all the words right at your fingertips that you need in order to help your students and prioritize your therapy. And once you go through the course, you'll know exactly how to do that. So it might be a couple hours for a couple weeks up front that you might have to commit to learn this process, but after you do that, you'll save time in the long run. And the best part of it is that you have lifetime access to the material. You don't have to travel to get this information. It comes right to you online. You can log in whenever you need to. So if, if you find that you're getting slammed right now or you sign up and then you get busy for a couple weeks, you can always make your purchase now and then come back to it when you have time or review it if you ever need to watch it again. So again, this is everything you get if you enroll in the Vocabulary Foundation course today. You get the entire course video trainings, the 540 tier two words, the basic concepts for language therapy download, the formal assessment and functional assessment protocols, all valued at $465, you get all of this for just $147 if you join before enrollment closes on Friday. If you wait, you'll miss out and you won't be able to enroll and I'm not sure when I'm opening up enrollment again. So if you're sick of second guessing yourself and if you're ready to start building the vocabulary foundation your students need to succeed in school, click join now below this video to sign up. Thanks again for watching, and I'd love to see you in the members area.